Good evening. The, this is the Yuma County Redistricting Advisory Commission meeting, the RAC. Uh, today is Tuesday, September 14th, 5 p.m. Um, Howard, may I ask you to lead us in the pledge? Sure. Pledge allegiance to the flag for the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So some housekeeping items. If you are parked in the rear employee gated parking lot, uh, please move your vehicle to the front north parking lot to avoid having your vehicle locked in. Uh, please sign in on the sign-in sheet at the table by the rear door. <clears throat> please fill out a speaker card at the table by the rear door if you wish to address the commission. Give this card to the staff. Please speak at the podium and state your name and address for the record. Before speaking, please address the chair, not the audience or staff when speaking at the podium. If you have handouts to give to the commission, please give them to the staff to distribute. If you show information on the overhead projector, please give printouts to the staff to become part of the permanent record. Restrooms and drinking fountains are down the hall behind this meeting room. Feel free to use these facilities as needed. Please no food or beverages other than water in the meeting room. Thank you. This is the call of the meeting uh, to the public. The call of, to the public will be open for the duration of this meeting. It is noticed, noted that we do not have any members of the public present at this meeting. At this time, we will move to move into um, adopting the minutes of the July 29th, 2021 commission meeting. Is there a discussion regarding the minutes? Madam Chairman? Yes. I'd just like to note for the public that call to the public is open. Yes, it is. And I appreciate that, Chairwoman. Um, so anybody who wishes to speak at any time during our meeting is welcome. Thank you. That is correct. Has everyone had an opportunity to review the minutes? Madam Chair, yes. I move that we go ahead and accept the minutes as presented. The motion has been made uh, to adopt the July 29. 2021 minutes. Um, may we please have a, a second? I'll second. second. Lozma? Thank you. And uh, I want to make a roll call vote uh, on the adoption of the minutes. Danette Nichols? Aye. Gilbert Hernandez? Howard Blitz? Aye. Jorge Duarte? Aye. Judith Gill? Aye. Uh, Martha Garcia? Aye. Nancy Meister? Aye. Nancy Tucker? Aye. Pamela Walsma? Aye. Russell McLeod? Aye. And Alicia Zermano? Aye. And Fernie Kiros? Aye. Um, Lorena Zendejas is excused today that uh, motion carried unanimously of the members present. Thank you. 
Agenda item number four, the Yuma County 2020 Census data, a presentation by Bruce Adelson, Federal Compliance Consulting, LLC. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon. Uh, today we're going to do a um, overview of the law of redistricting. Next slide, please. Now, I am the uh, primary consultant to Yuma County for redistricting this cycle. And just a little bit of information about me. I was a senior trial attorney for the U.S. Department of Justice in D.C., Civil Rights Division voting section. I had some enforcement responsibility in over Yuma County in the 2000 redistricting cycle. And during the 2010 cycle, I was the voting rights expert for the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. And we prevailed in all legal challenges, and we won nine to nothing in the Supreme Court, and they sustain the legality of our redistricting plans. And the last point I really wanted to stress this is the legal process. There are a lot of laws, rules, and requirements, federal and state. Most of them are federal. that are really important to understand and to follow. Not surprisingly, there always is a lot of interest and attention around redistricting nationally, <coughs> excuse me, and in this state. That hasn't changed this cycle. So, yes, specific laws and rules to follow. And my old friends at the Justice Department did something they've never done before last week. They released redistricting guidance from the department explaining what many of the legal requirements are. They've never done that before. And I've always been of the mind when DOJ does something, they don't do it by accident. So I believe that they're doing this as a marker to just let everybody know we're paying attention and we're watching what happens and to also inform people what some of the legal requirements are. So as you can see, uh, go back one slide, please. The primary federal law that concerns redistricting is the Voting Rights Act of 1965, primarily Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which we'll talk a little bit about today. <clears throat> That's the main federal requirement in addition to the U.S. Constitution that binds redistricting. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, following the release of the census, of course, everybody has census data now. And in fact, on September 17th, on Friday, the Census Bureau is releasing their final batch of information concerning the census. The data should be the same as what was released in August. The Bureau is releasing additional tables and other information, a lot of information about race, for example, that will instruct and inform redistricting generally. Uh, and as you can see, the department in their last sentence, it is the department's view that guidance identifying its general approach to Section 2, the primary part of the VRA that applies to redistricting, uh, in this context would be useful, which I certainly agree with that. Next slide, please. So I also want to give you some of the main takeaways from the Harris versus Arizona Redistricting Commission case 10 years ago. And the main thing, which is what the Supreme Court um, reinforced at oral argument and it's in its opinion, show your work. It's really important that you create a full, robust, transparent, explanatory record that shows exactly why you do what you do, what you considered in coming to your decisions. Uh, that was one of the reasons that the Supreme Court was unanimous 10 years ago. We showed everything. And all the claims that were raised against the commission in the lawsuit, the Supreme Court batted away by saying, well, that's not what the record says. That Your point is just not here. There's no evidence to prove that. So if you stick with that, just like what we learned in elementary school, and the teachers always said, show your work, particularly with math, show your work, transparent, and have expertise to guide you and answer questions, rather than to wonder whether A or B applies. Next slide, please. There's, we have a question? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you explain to us how um, a majority is a minority when they're not? You mean like in the context of majority minority districts? Well, yeah. When, if you have a, uh, just say a population that is, 70% of one particular demographic, 
and 30% of another demographic, that the 70% demographic is the minority. I don't understand that. And I think we should have a full explanation of how that works, because I don't get it. So I'm, I'm surmising that in, in Yuma County is a majority Hispanic county, as I understand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, for a long time. Are, are, do you mean that the fact that Hispanics are majority in Yuma County, that I'm not sure I, I really understand. Oh, no, Hispanic, questions. yeah, sure. It's the majority of my workforce is Hispanic. Right. They, they are the majority, um, but it was explained to us in the previous meeting that they are a minority, and I don't get it. Okay, I think I logically. That. Well, as I think you could, you could probably surmise. There's not always a lot of logic when it comes to legal and <laughs> constitutional requirements, but I think in this context, the Voting Rights Act, when it passed in 1965, and when President Johnson signed it into law, the Voting Rights Act is intended to protect racial minorities nationally. So whether or not a particular group is a majority or minority in a particular county, city, town, or state really doesn't affect the weight and the requirements of the federal law. Does so, that make sense to you? Well, yes, it does, because Hispanics uh, nationally are a minority. Hispanics in Arizona, have, well, let me back up a minute. The, the main requirements of the laws as they relate to redistricting and protecting certain minority groups is based on historical discrimination. Arizona has had significant historical discrimination, not only in reflected in court decisions and Justice Department actions and all kinds of other legally relevant situations. So that's basically the answer. May I have a, okay. uh, sure. I have a question. So would it be that um, the terms don't have the same meaning as far as Major, majority minority for voting versus minority uh, population under uh, defined under, for example, the Civil Rights Act that defines what is a minority. Uh, is that how uh, one would then classify Hispanics, blacks as a minority, but for, and, and for voting purposes, then you can have a minority group that have the majority voting power in a district. I think that that's a good point. Something like that? Yeah, I think that's a good point, Madam Chair. I think that the, the words are relative, given whatever the circumstances are, in voting in elections. Minority groups as defined in the Voting Rights Act are Hispanics, Asian Americans, African Americans, Alaska Natives, Native Americans. Madam Chair, why are not Caucasians a minority? Because we are a minority in this county. I think you'll have to talk to Congress about that. No, I'm, no, I'm talking to you. I'm telling you what the law says. That's what Congress passed in 1965. Do you see the absurdity I'm an attorney, sir. I've been an attorney for almost 40 years. I follow what the law says. I don't interject my own opinions and thoughts about why certain things are the way they are. I do what the law tells me to do. And in this case, the Supreme Court has been very clear. The Voting Rights Act is very clear. My job is to apply the law and interpret the law and explain it as needed. So that's my answer. Madam Chair, if I, if I may, uh, I agree with Mr. McLeod. Uh, the law that we're talking about was during the 60s. We have become more modern since then, and sometimes we use the old laws to benefit one way or the other. And I believe what Mr. McLeod and I believe is what we're doing here, minority majority. That it's, it's unfair, I don't care how you color it, uh, and I respect your, your position, sir, I really do. But we are modern Yuma, Arizona. We are modern Arizona. Do we have prejudices in the back? Yes, we have. We had. But the years, because of the civil rights laws, we have progressed to become a better nation. But we keep on going back to this. Uh, 
minority majority and all you're causing is problems because it doesn't fit here anymore and i i know what you're going to say you're you're following the law but we're trying to do redistricting meaning it's a new thing a new district in a new redistricting if so but we're working with old laws and that's what i have a problem with. and i respect your point i understand very well what you're explaining having lived in this country my entire life and seen the progress from the time that i was born through today i agree with you the salient point remains the same the laws are the laws and the, if the laws require what they require that's my job my job is to inform and provide information about the law i don't have the power to change the law i didn't have the power to do that at the justice department I certainly don't have the power to do that now. So what I always explain, we have the right under the Constitution to petition to redress grievances. If you have an issue, complaint, disagreement with the law, it's you petition Madam Congress. Chair. Yes, Mr. McCloud. Can you show me where the law says that a majority is a minority? I mean, can you actually show me the law that says these things? I'll show you the parts of the Voting Rights Act that define minority groups. But as I as I said, the law is the law. Well, I, can you show that to Mr. me? McCann, I, mean, I, I don't understand. Mr. McCann? Yeah. If we could allow him to complete this presentation, and then we can have a discussion uh, with regards to the finer points of uh, the definitions. <coughs> um, I'd be happy to do that? I'm sure I'm fine with that. Thank yep. you. Thank you very much. Okay, so to continue, these are the requirements under Arizona state law, the Voting Rights Act, and the U.S. Constitution. Uh, the, got the Board of Supervisors. Counties must establish districts or precincts as required by law. You do elect by di districts. You don't elect at large. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, as I said, is primarily Section 2 concerning redistricting. Section 203 is about language, translations, and information in languages other than English. <clears throat> U.S. Constitution has a one-person, one-vote requirement, which is a little different from what the State Redistricting Commission has. They have uh, virtually no leeway with congressional districts. They have to all be equal. Their state legislative districts and your supervisory districts do not have to be absolutely to the penny equal in population. They should be as close to equal as possible. And if they deviate from being equal in population, you need to explain why. But you're not under the same requirements as a state is to produce congressional districts. The Supreme Court and the Constitution are very clear about that. There can be no deviation that has to be relative. That has to be absolutely equal. So these are the basic requirements for redistricting. The first is comply with federal law, the U.S. Constitution and the Voting Rights Act. The next is equal population, as we've been talking about. Criteria A and B are, of course, federal, and they take supremacy over state requirements. All plans must satisfy the federal criteria. They must, districts must be compact and contiguous, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Respect communities of interest meaning the, there are all kinds of definitions for communities of interest. They could be of historical nature, cultural. There is no one specific de definition for what a community of interest is. Use visible geographic features, city, town, and county boundaries, and undivided census tracts using a, a road, a highway, a river, a mountain range are all very acceptable when it comes to redistricting. Madam Chair. Mr. McCloud? Um, I'd like to point out just for the public that equal population means persons, not registered voters. It means right. living persons. Yes, persons. that's right. Legislative districts, uh, the state has a requirement to produce districts that are politically competitive between the two major parties. You do not. That requirement only applies to the state redistricting commission and what they produce, it does not apply to supervisorial districts, for example. If you choose to make them competitive, you can certainly do that, but you're not required to. Next slide, please. So what are what does compact and contiguous mean? A district is contiguous, as you see, if all the lines it created are connected. 
basically if you can walk from one part of the district to the other and stay in the same district. That means the district is contiguous. The degree to which all districts in a particular <coughs> map are contiguous can be limited by natural boundaries. So if you happen to have a river cutting through a district, that may impact its contiguousness. That doesn't always happen, of course, but it is something to keep in mind. Absent a natural boundary, just imagine walking from point A to point B in the district and staying in the district, not going into another district as you're walking from point to point. Next slide, please. Compactness is a little more complex because there is no one specific method for measuring it. Typically, it's how a district looks and appears. That will give you a sense if it's compact. You've probably all seen, all you have to do is go to Google and put in the term gerrymander, really crazily shaped districts in a lot of states. Those are not compact. Uh, if you look at the shape of the current supervisorial districts that they are considered to be compact, having a completely square rectangular district is probably unlikely because of all the requirements that exist. But compactness is also kind of like you know it when you see it. If you see a crazy wild shape, it's probably not going to be compact. If your district is reasonably compact, if it can fit within a geometric shape, then that's looking pretty good. Next slide, please. District boundaries should respect and not divide communities of interest. Now, that's something that, of course, you can choose to do or not do. That means. Uh, maintaining city, town, and school district boundaries. That's not a specific legal requirement. That's something you have the discretion to do or not do. If a community of interest has a strong policy voice in its current district, <coughs> splitting it into two districts under a redistricting plan that you're going to be doing may be a, a problem. People may not like that. They may feel their voices are being diluted or weakened. So that's also something to look out for. But it's important to remember that other than the two specific federal criteria at the beginning, most of the things that we're talking about today, you have a lot of discretion with. What you choose to do and not do, how much you choose to do, you have a lot of discretion about where you can go and how you draw the lines other than the two main federal criteria. Next slide. So we talked about following visible geographic features. Those are always good best practices to follow in redistricting. Next slide, please. What is what's called an ideal population? <clears throat> Let's say Yuma County has 100,000 people, and you have five supervisorial districts. The ideal population is 20,000 per district. Now you can have a deviation of, let's say, 10% across all the districts. 10%, what that means is 5% above the ideal and 5% below. Combining them gives you that 10% deviation. 10% is kind of a rough rule of thumb for determining whether the deviation is legal or constitutional. It's not an absolute drop dead. If it's 10%, we're good. If it's 10.1%, we're not. But it's a good guide to follow. Yes, sir? So it can't be it can't be 10% over. Uh, it can't be more than 10% over. So no, but, it, but it could be 10% or up to 10% Up to over, 10%. Or, or, or up to 10% under. But that's a good, a good way to look at it. <clears throat> Excuse me, although if it's 10% above, 10% below, that's a total of 20%. It could be 5%. Each district can be 5% or above or below. That's going to equal the 10% deviation. But one district... Could one district be 10% above and another district 10% below? Is that possible? No. I, you could have one district that's 10% above and another district that's 1% below, and that brings you below that overall 10% okay. threshold. Again, this is a guide. Don't think while you're doing this that if we're at 10%, we're bulletproof legally. That's not true. But it's a good rule of thumb if you're under 10%. You're in good shape. Because I think in the redistricting 10 years ago, the redistricting commission was like 9.4% total deviation. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court said that was fine. They looked at what our explanation was for the deviation. They said, you're good. No problems. Mr. Adelson? Yes. 
So how was that 10% uh, derived at? Who, who said 10%? Was it the Supreme Court? Yeah, the Supreme Court decided a long time ago, and there's been a lot of litigation about this. It's, it's looked at, I, I, what I explained to all the jurisdictions I work with and all my clients, it's not a safe harbor, meaning, you're, as I said, you're bulletproof. It's a good rule of thumb. Stay under 10%. But just because you're under 10% doesn't mean you're immune to losing a legal challenge or that your district is absolutely <coughs> legal. It's a good rule of thumb to, to follow, rather than 12%, 15%. Anything above 10% would be worrisome. Madam Chair. Okay. Um, just to clarify for the public, um, we're looking at um, one district is 5% below, another district is 5% above. That's 10. Right. Correct? Right. Okay. So if you're 7 and 5, now you're 12. Right. And the not 10% here versus your 10% under this district, it's a com it's combined. 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 Yes, yeah. the compliance is judged by the entire plan. Yeah. So if you're doing really well in one district and it's 0.01 deviation, but the next district is 18% deviation, that really won't matter until the whole plan is there. And if you're over 10, my recommendation is you need to go back and It's an addition it. of both. Right. It's the whole plan. It's not just one district. But as you do district and create each district, if you're way off for any one district, that may skew the final number. So it's something to just watch for as you're proceeding. You don't want to be too out of whack either way, above or below. Just stay within that 10% area. And if at the end of the the process, you're under 10%, I expect you will be a fair amount under 10%, then you're likely going to be okay. So yes, thank you. Any amount less or greater than the number, that's what's called a deviation. Plus five, minus five, plus three, plus eight. That's a deviation. The law allows for some deviations as we're talking about, and that's generally at and below 10%. This issue regularly comes up, I often talk to Jurisdictions I work with, and in fact, I did with two today, 10%, as I said, is just not a guarantee. It's a good safe harbor in the sense that it's a best practice, and it's not a red flag. I don't like red flags when it comes to legalities. Next slide, please. Race is always a part of the redistricting process that has been for decades. Being race conscious or aware of race during the redistricting process is not by itself illegal. And there's a, a quote from a US Supreme Court case and a, and a reference to a case called Shaw, that Shaw v. Reno, that case was either in the 80s or the early 90s, it's another Supreme Court redistricting case. There are a lot of Supreme Court redistricting cases. Next slide, please. So the Supreme Court has clearly stated that a redistricting plan will not be held invalid simply because the, quote, redistricting is performed with consciousness of race, unquote, or because a jurisdiction intentionally creates a majority-minority district that's compliant with the law, that's not going to mean right off the bat, this is illegal, we're going to throw this out. Next slide, please. So what's important to realize when you're looking at race and redistricting is race cannot be the predominant factor in redistricting. You can't decide whenever you begin looking at maps, you know what, we're going to, race is our only issue. That's the only thing we're looking at. It's the most important thing. That would mean that race predominates your redistricting. That would be unconstitutional. So race is a factor in redistricting. And the way I've explained this in a lot of situations is predomination is like driving a car. When we drive cars, we do a lot of things. We look at the speedometer, we turn on the air conditioning, watch the traffic, look both ways, turn on music, all kinds of things. But we're not just doing one thing. Because you know and I know if we did just one thing, if we're just fixing that air conditioning, you know we're not going to have a good result to driving. So look at 
for domination the same way. It is one of many factors. It just cannot be the primary factor or the only factor. This is one of the more revealing uh, redistricting decisions in the last cycle. Alabama Legislative Black Caucus versus the state of Alabama. In that case, the state of Alabama used uh, mechanical uh, targets for populating uh, what in Alabama are majority minority districts with the minority being the black population. So rather than figuring out, okay, what do we need to do? What does the law require? They just said 70% here, 55% here, 65% here. Supreme Court said can't do that. As you see in the last paragraph, there has to be a strong basis and evidence in support of choices you make regarding your districts as they relate to race. So the factor to remember is, again, race can't be the predominant factor, the main factor, the only factor. And when you're coming up with populations in, in your districts, you can't just decide District 1, 90%, District 2, 85%. Those are guaranteed to be tossed out by a federal court. Next slide, please. Two terms that are important in redistricting, cracking and packing. Uh, Cracking refers to dividing supporters among various districts so that they fall short of the majority in each one. The US Supreme Court has said that issues of partisanship, politics in redistricting are not a federal issue. They may be under state law, but they're not a federal issue. So if you decided to have districts with one district with 90% Democrats, another with 85% Republicans. That's really not going to offend federal law because federal law really doesn't cover that. The Supreme Court was very clear a few years ago, Chief Justice Roberts said, there is no federal claim for discriminating against people basically based on their party registration or their uh, how they affiliate as far as a party. But that is different, of course, with race. Cracking means dividing a racial group into many districts to reduce their voting power. So if there is a majority, let's say there's 60% Hispanics in one particular district, instead of creating a district that's 45%, let's say, or 50% Hispanic, dividing that up among several districts, 10% Hispanics here, 20% here, that's considered cracking because you're dividing the group into several. Packing is the opposite. That's concentrating one group overwhelmingly in one district. So creating districts as they did in Alabama of 75, 80% black population. The Supreme Court said you can't do that. That's a racial gerrymander, unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution because you're just mechanically grouping people together and diluting the opportunity of black voters to elect what's considered their candidates of choice by diluting their power and packing them, concentrating them into one potential district. Next slide, please. So these are the current districts in Yuma County, supervisorial districts, that were uh, created 10 years ago. Madam Chair. I have a question based on what you just said. So Would it be legal to divide that voting population into small segments that could not elect persons that represent them? Would it be illegal to crack a minority population into small groups? Right, that's what you just said. Right, I, so, right if you go back to the previous slide. Right, so is it illegal to do that? I, I would think it would be. Yes, I think in, in overwhelming situations, in the majority, yes. Now there are some tests and some legalities that have to be evaluated, but essentially cracking, dividing into small groups, a protected category of people would be likely illegal. One would think so. Yes, well, in my experience, that has invariably been the consequence. I probably misunderstood what you said, but that's what it sounded like, that you could pack these people into a small group. Well, no, I'm not that saying that. That was illegal. No, no, you can't pack them into a large group, and you can't crack them into many small groups. 
Okay. I, I, it just was a point of interest. Thank you. Next slide, please. And let's go to the next one. So these, this is your current 2020 Yuma County Census information. Uh, this is from the 2020 Census. As you can see, the 2020 Census has concluded that Yuma County has a population of 203,881 people. Ten years ago, your population was 195,751. As you can see, in each of the five districts, they're all pretty much out of balance either uh, over or underpopulated with the third and fourth districts being, and fifth district being the most. Third district is, excuse me, almost 8% underpopulated. Fourth district is 15% overpopulated. Fifth district is 8% underpopulated. And the, the last line, it shows you according to the census, the growth rate, population rate in each district over the last 10 years. You can see the census has determined that two districts, uh, District 3 and District 5, had negative growth over the last 10 years, while Districts 1, 2, and 4 had population increased. So these are the actual census numbers they were uh, that we uh, crunched when the census data were released last month. Next slide, please. And this, I know this is difficult to see. This is the census data by race uh, in total population and at the bottom, citizen voting age population. And that's distributed across all five districts, the overall population and the citizen voting age population. Voting age population is the key because if you have a big difference between the total population, let's say it's 60%, but only 40% are of voting age, well, that's less than a majority. That may impact the viability of the district. So my recommendation is always look at voting age population. Citizen voting age population is also relevant too. There may be a dip, big difference, or there may be a small difference by district in voting age population and citizen voting age population. Yes. Breaking it down between districts? Yes, as you could. From where, what let's what? see. It's district, as you could see, the, um, the districts are, this is the, the total. That's the, the total? Time. It's not labeled at all. No, it's labeled. not. District 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The last column is total population. Yes. So what is the total 120? 126,909. What does that mean? Population, the total population across all four, all five districts from 10 years ago. Well, I thought there was 200 and, 203,000. Mr. Blitz, that's, yeah, that's a... I'm sorry, yes. Voting age population, which is different than your overall total population. Okay, th this is total population. population yeah. But the 203,000 figure in the previous slide, yeah. that was total population. And this, this is, is voting, voting age. age voting age, okay. Okay, Mr. Adelson, if you could go um, back a few minutes to the um, slide number 19. Okay. Yes. So if now to correlate. The population then in District 4, at, it, that was in 2010, was that 46,000? No, that's 2020. So I'm sorry, 2020. Right. So what we did is we took okay. the configurations of the districts and downloaded the census data by district. So that's two th right now. That's today's Today, as population. we stand here, 2020 census date, census okay. total for that district is 46,962. Okay. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Clarification. One more clarification. Our job is to make sure that the numbers in the total population are equal or relatively equal as opposed to the number of voting age population. Yeah, that's a great point. You look at your, your redistricting for the entire county. 
You're not redistricting just for Voting. people who are 18 and over. So that's a great point. It's the total population of the county. Or, Why are we getting the other numbers? Well, because as we talked about, there's a lot of data, and you're going to get more data and more information when you're actually creating districts. Looking at voting age population is a relevant statistic, but you are creating districts for everybody who lives here, not just for people who are 18 and over. You look at 18 and over because those are the people who vote. So if you create a district that has 30% deviation and you, and you make these calculations based on the voting age population, that's an important legal requirement in determining the viability of the district, the racial population of the district. But your job is for the entire county, of course. Voting age population is one of many statistics and data points that you look at in redistricting. Yeah. One, one more point of clarification. If we can get these lines correct where these districts are all at 40,000 people. Okay, sure. I just, so they're all equal at 40,000. I'm just mm -hmm. going to use round numbers here. What difference does it make? How many Hispanics, how many Caucasians, how many legal age voters? What difference does that make? As long as they're all 40,000, what, what's the big deal? Well, there's the big deal is that what we've been talking about. The Voting Rights Act says you can't just look at population. That is an important part of redistricting. But if you create districts here that are, let's say, pack all Hispanics into one or two districts, that would not be compliant with the Voting Rights Act and also would offend the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Madam Chair. Mr. McLeod? I understand where he's going. If you look at these numbers to me, and I'm always very simplistic, you can cut these lines and we could be done in like five minutes, right? If that's all you looked at was bring people in, bring people out, for instance, district, I believe it's four. If you went from county 14th to county 16th, and I'm just guessing, is it, yeah. all of a sudden those districts become equal. Talk about gerrymandering. You look at district four, you bring everything in from county 8th or 8th street, take it out of district four and move it into five or one. Probably five. These numbers really quickly come into order. Well, as I think I, I've been talking about, and I think that we'll be seeing this going forward, if you just divide the county into five districts of 40,000 people, that will not withstand a legal challenge. It's, it just will not. Madam Chair, I, I, I agree real quick. You know, District 2, District 4, it's 3,000 people are different. So the reason why these lines are made up is population-wise, how they voted. And I know that we've also discussed the incumbents that are there. It's just a reality. You know, our congressional districts are also, you know, we were at the meeting where people were saying we all wanted a one district, you know, split up, Tucson still control, make it a river corridor. But at the end of the day, it's still representation and people that are voting and make sure that those individuals have a voice in their communities. Why District 4? More land, but less populated. I'm sure, you know, District 2 just has 3,000 more. So just dividing 40 here, 40 here, it's K. I mean, that doesn't really show the representation of countywide and how many people. Um, and also, City of Yuma is more expensive, you know, to live, you know, in the outskirts, minorities move out there. You know. I, I just, I'm looking at, at the overall, so um, just putting 40,000 and saying, oh, we're done, it's not what we're here for, is making sure each district is represented, um, each, you know, county supervisor has a voice there, and we also have to make sure that those voices are continuing to be heard. Madam Chair. But Mr. Hernandez. 
Okay. Uh, I was at the last redistricting meeting, and that was brought up a lot. And my question is to, to all of you, each and every one of you, uh, being sound mind, we're all intelligent. Every one of us is there somewhat intelligent. Even if the districts were changed, what makes you feel these people would not be represented? We keep on hearing this victim, victim mentality. If, if people were, districts were changed, people are still going to be represented. That's a fact. And if we must move on and quit this hyphenated American BS and go as Americans and let's get our job done thinking the better use of our time helping Americans help Americans. We got to quit being victims. We're all going to be represented. <clears throat> so let's quit being a victim of not being represented. We are going to be represented. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Mr. McLeod. I just heard a reference to congressional districts. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. We are not here about congressional districts. It has nothing at all to do with why we're here. We're here for these districts right in front of us. And I got to tell you, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a very simplistic individual. As I described to you, when you look at these numbers, just moving these lines a little bit, bringing people in, bringing people out, it's really very easy. This does not need to be partisan, divisive. It's really simple to me. Look at the numbers. Move people in, move people out. Like I said, you know, District 2, bring it a little bit south. District 4, chop a little bit off because they grew so much in South County. We could be done in five minutes. It's not that difficult. And, and, and we heard... Thank you, Mr. McLeod. I... Um... I, I get your point. I think we get your point of, um, you know, it seems like a very simplistic process. Um, I was fortunate enough to serve on the last redistricting commission. And I remember that it, once we delved into the, uh, the data and moving lines around, it was not that simple. It, it took a lot of thought as to uh, moving people in and out of, uh, of districts. Um, what, was the, what was the thought process? What was the difficulty? Now, I do understand. I know that um, uh, Supervisor Porches was uh, pretty vocal about that, but as I recall, the plan that he had put forward put two supervisors in the same district, which is, you know, untenable. I, well, I can give you an example. Unity is, we're not so divisive. And if, we're not divisive. And it's not about, you know, having a division or, or it, it's about, you know, what's the best <clears throat> thing for the county. I will give you my personal example of what I recall. I only recall one thing though. I was in super I was in District One, live in historic Yuma. And I went and I was moved into District Five. And so that was very different for me. Personally, because now I was in a different district. So yes, we have to be careful for for those things of taking into consideration you know, what lines are we moving? How did, that, how did that impact you personally? I mean... Personally? You had a, yeah, you had a, had a different representative, but... Well, I had a, you I saw had the a different... You voice? I still had a voice. I still have a voice. I just had a different representative. Um, but now... Um, 
you know, that's really the only thing that impacted me. I have, I now have a different representative. A different human being representing you. Yeah. That's all. And that happens with every election. Yes. Every election, we have a different human being, or perhaps the same one if we choose. But I don't see this being so difficult. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Thank you for your comment. Mr. Blitz? Um, one more point of clarification on page 21 of the, the data there. So just explain the top number there in the far right-hand corner where it says total, 64%. 64% of the total population or of the total voting age population? This is a voting age chart. The okay, so this is all voting age. Yeah. Page 21, this page 21, 21 is voting age chart, correct? Voting age and distribution by race. And these terms are all included in uh, federal law regulation in the voting rights act. And what gives me a sense of how the districts are currently populated by race. Okay, even even the percentages below the actual number listed there. I'm sorry. The For those percent, the 52 percent number right below the 126,909. What does that represent? This is this is a citizen voting age population. Remember, we talked about people who are citizens and people who are not citizens. Citizen voting age population may be different than the voting age population of the entire county or of each individual district. That doesn't tell you what the difference is. But if you create a district where you think the population is 70%, but the citizen voting age population is lower than 70%, let's say it's 50% or 45%, that may impact the district's compliance with federal law and what we've discussed before about protecting protected categories of people. Okay, so yes. I'm not sure, Mr. I'm not sure I'm following this. Mr. You said Blitz citizen Blitz. voting age population. Does that mean there's a non-citizen voting age population? This is a term that's used by the census. Okay. Citizen voting age population. It's a population of people who are U.S. citizens and are of voting age. And that's what the one... Madam Chair, just to yeah. clarify, what, what is happening right here is because there's individuals who are 18 to 60, but they're legal permanent residents who cannot vote, but the census does not classify them. So they're trying to make sure these are 18 to whatever older who are U.S. citizens that are actual able to vote. Non, there's a lot of legal permanent residents in our community or non-citizens who our data census accounted for who cannot vote so those numbers got yeah but those people out. those people aren't included here correct but they're included in the overall population I'm talking about this page right not here. the citizen voting age population that's correct okay so the 126909 only represents the people who are citizens and that are voting age or voting or voting age that's correct. or voting age okay Mr. Hernandez? Yes, ma'am. I, I must have been paying attention because what is OMB allocation method? Office of Management and Budget. Because they, they're there because of federal regulations. They came up with uh, an enumeration regulation more than 20 years ago from the Office of Management and Budget to, for classifications that are relevant to redistricting. Why are there two lines of Hispanic Latino? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The top. And top. Then well, then, then, and then there's this Hispanic one. Then chair. Oh, this is in the middle. Give me one, one moment. Can you use this one? Or turn, turn that one so we can see now. We can't see what you're saying. Uh, that, oh. That's great. Okay. okay. That's right. Yes. The middle, the top. Total population OMB allocation method. That's just one method of federal law, under federal law to classify people for redistricting. The next is called the total population 
allocation method. That's just another method. There's not a lot of difference in the numbers, but we're providing them because we're providing you with I am all the data confused. that are relevant to redistricting. Their numbers may not be different, but we wanted to give you the full picture of the data that the Census Bureau is releasing. Mr. So, Wilson? So confusing. Just a minute. G give me a second, please. So let me ask a question. So the voting age chart that you're showing us, page 21, can be um, divided into three categories. Is that correct? It, One is the total population, the OMB allocation. Yes. The second category is the total population, any part allocation method. And then the third category is citizen voting age population. So the, you're right that the first two parts, there's really a lot, not a lot of difference in the population. But again, as an attorney, my job is to provide as much information as I have available. We have this available. The census has released it. We're providing it to you. How you use it, how you view this as significant, important, informative is up to you. We're providing the information because federal law says this is how you classify people for the purposes of redistricting. There are not a lot of differences in the first two numbers. The citizen voting age population, as you can see, there are significant differences in the various numbers. And again, this is all provided to you because you need all of this information to redistrict. Ms. Nichols, do you have a question? This is from the new census, correct? Brand new census. Next slide, please. As you may have heard, there have been a lot of questions about the census data, reliability, undercounts. The Census Bureau has a method for challenging census data called the count question resolution, but it's very limited. It's limited to what about what you can challenge. You can't make a successful challenge because you claim that certain populations were undercounted in the census, <clears throat> unfortunately, every 10 years. There are a lot of undercounts nationally. That's not for this process. Next slide, please. It's basically for provable duplication errors, typos, things like that. What could be challenged? This is a great example. Next slide, please. In 2011, the Census Bureau revised its population counts based on two 2010 census blocks in Norfolk, Virginia where an error placed ships that were supposed to be docked in Norfolk incorrectly. That was very easily spotted through satellite imaging. So two ships should have been counted, but weren't counted. That's an example of what a successful challenge is. Saying that there's, you believe there are 50,000 more people in Yuma County than the census says, that challenge will not succeed. Court challenges will not succeed. No federal court is going to throw out census data. So this process exists, but as you can see, it's very limited in scope to what it can be used for. It can't be used successfully to challenge the overall census or claims of underpopulation. Next slide, please. And that's me. That's my contact information. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to be with you today and to provide the information to you. I look forward to our having an ongoing conversation. Please contact me if you have questions going forward. Are there any additional questions? Um, yes, Mr. Adelson. Um, Mr. McLeod, did you want to uh, revisit your earlier questions uh, concerning the majority-minority issue? Um, I don't think so, Madam Chair. I think. My point was made. I, to me, <clears throat> I'm not sure why we're considering these factors. Um, we all are part of this community, and I think we all know that in this community, none of it matters. So to me, we figure out how to divide this up, boom, and we're out of here. I know I'm very simplistic in my thinking, but that is how I think. And, and I, you know, race, schmace. You know, we just, 
move it around and we'll, we'll make have it. this as easy as possible so long as it um, complies with current law, which is our duty to right. follow the current law. Um, so my question is, Mr. Allison, what is your role for this board? Are you a consultant? We can call you individually. Uh, yes, I am a consultant. My uh, I'm contracted consultant with Yuma County. So in our process, I certainly invite as many questions as you have to, in order to guide you through what is a very complicated, complex process. So, so will you we, review we, if we are having proposals? Will you provide comments? Well, I think that the county be, may have its own process for how maps are submitted and how maps are then sent to us. And I'll certainly defer to the county about how they, what process they have for how you accept maps, what happens as you move forward with maps. Uh, what I, um, when I was referring to, f feel free to contact me if, it, if the, that's okay with the county, that if you have questions that I can answer, I'm happy to do that. If the county has a different process, I work for the county. So I certainly defer to them and respect what their rules and processes are. I know that this is a, a very overwhelming task in the sense that there's just a lot of information out there. People have very specific requests, expectations about how their redistricting will come up. You will hear more and more about what's happening in Phoenix with the state redistricting commission as they get closer to the finish. And you will also be hearing about lawsuits. Madam Chair. Lawsuits have already been filed, not here. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, Mr. Kirkies. Maybe this might clarify for the for the commission. Mr. Adelson, are you going to be present here in the meetings again, or is this your only visit here personally? No, I think that Ms. Ms. Anderson and I have talked about it. I expect that I will be here again, but my subcontractors will also be here. So we have a rotating schedule for coming to you. It will be a representative of the consulting entity here at each meeting? Yes, that's the plan. I think it would be more beneficial, Madam Chair, if, if the members contacting the consultant would do so here when they're present so that the benefit of the answer could do the entire commission. It, yes. It's going to be ineffective, I think, if one person calls and gets an answer, and then how are they going to communicate that to the rest of the commission? Madam Chair. I agree. Mr. McLeod? I absolutely reject the premise that this is complicated, It's not at all. And I want to remind the commission, the comment was made earlier about congressional blah, blah, blah. This is about county supervisor districts. It's really very simple. Just a minute. It had nothing to do. I mean, he brought it up also. In the, it's just the idea. They're, they're meeting to set up districts and rechanging them because of changing population on the census. It's the same thing we're doing here at a smaller, smaller our county. But the state is also doing. I was just making a point that they're doing the same thing, discussing That's lines fine. and changing. But however, the the truth is, these are county supervisors. It's almost <clears throat> like see, when people ask me, "What do you do as a county supervisor?" I would explain to them, "It's like city council for the county, right?" And Mr. McLeod, it's not that complex. I absolutely reject. The premise that it's complex, that it's hard to do. I'm sorry. Mr. McLeod, thank you for your um, comments and, <coughs> excuse me, they're well taken. And I believe that <clears throat> you need to give the commission an opportunity to get the work begun, started. Uh, and at this point, it's my opinion too early for us to determine the complexity of the work that we are going that we are charged with and so perhaps because of your considerable experience um, as a, a board supervisor county supervisor that you are more experienced in these processes than those of us who have not uh, had that opportunity, had those opportunities. 
But I don't want do, to presume that, Madam Chair. But, but we do want to say that, I mean, I look forward to working with you and what opinions you have. And, and you bring a different set of skills that many of us don't have. Well, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. And I, I don't mean to presume. I'm just trying to make a point. I, it's just, I'm sorry. And your point These are is county well supervisor taken. districts. It's not that complex. Correct. And I think we should be done with our process very quickly. We should show the public that we can work together and knock this thing out. And it does not need to be adversarial whatsoever. It's not adversarial. My opinion. I don't believe it's adversarial. Or complex or. Did you have a comment? Did you want to? Have a question? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think that um, maybe the process would be speedier um, if we just stay on task. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Very well. Um, any other comments, questions uh, for Mr. Adelson? Thank you very much, Mr. Adelson. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, item number five. Discussion and action to approve the redistricting schedule. Good evening, Commissioners. Tiffany Anderson, Election Director for Yuma County. Uh, the item you have before you today is a draft redistricting schedule for the remainder of the process. Um, it is up for discussion today. I'm going to start by walking you through the schedule. You have it in front of you as well as on the screen here. The first set of dates that are in gray are things that have already occurred. So we're going to move down to after the draft future schedule. So today is the 14th of September. It is our redistricting advisory commission meeting. The next item that we are looking to schedule is a virtual public education event sometime in early October. Um, I'm going to be working with the consultants on which date works best for them, but we will probably try to target the lunch hour. Since it is virtual, that'll give individuals the opportunity to tune in. We will also be recording this education session and posting on the county's redistricting website so that anyone who joins the process later than um, when we have that event scheduled can watch it and you know be up to date on what redistricting is and how they can be involved. So that public education experience um, that you can see, it's really meant to educate the community on the process, uh, what our Yuma County census data is that you just saw here tonight, uh, how to provide input and feedback both through these public meetings as well as the public hearings that we are anticipating will occur in the districts in January, um, as well as the online mapping tools. So these are all the different avenues that our community can be involved in this process with us here um, right now. So at the same time, concurrently, at the beginning of October, we're hoping to have that public mapping tool available on the redistricting website. This allows individuals in the community to go into the mapping tool and actually draw their own draft districts. Um, several of the tools even offer all of the population data so they can move the lines and you, they can see those numbers change. Those can be submitted to the consultants for consideration to be brought forward um, for you in future mapping. Uh, we are going to have that available hopefully from the beginning of October until November 15th, which is one week before your November RAC meeting, which means the consultant will have plenty of time to take any last minute public comment from those um, draft maps and incorporate it in the November meeting. Um, Ms. Chair? Madam Chair? Uh, yes, I'm Mr. Question. So we, as members of this commission, have access to this mapping tool? Yes, sir. Yes. So like I said, that was concurrent October through the uh, middle of November with that public mapping tool being available. Uh, our next redistricting advisory commission meeting is October 25th that you see here. We are hoping to have presentation of the initial maps from our mapping consultants. Um, that will be up for discussion at that time. We are going to be reviewing both Board of Supervisor districts as well as the community college districts. So this is going to be a dual purpose. Um, most Arizona counties, those are one in the same. 
uh, Yuma is unique that we used to be, uh, La Paz used to be a part of Yuma County. And when they split off in the 1980s, that community college district also split. So um, the seats on the, the community district board. So the community college district has three districts in Yuma County, two in La Paz. We will obviously only be responsible for the Yuma County districts and the five supervisorial districts. So we'll have two sets of maps for consideration. Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Ms. Anderson, um, when the presentation is made uh, for from the consultant, what criteria will they use? They're just their own, what they think, or are they going to take input from the community? Does that make sense? It, it does. Um, so that's, that's a little bit what I'm outlining here is hoping to pull in that public comment. The initial set will be based on the criterion that you saw today. So um, equal population, low deviation between the districts, consideration for, um, for race and for voting age population and communities of interest, city boundaries, uh, geographic features that are known to them. Uh, on the staff side, I've been providing them GIS data, different files. Mm -hmm. Uh, of from Yuma County, including special districts, re, um, you know, if it's a, what is it, redevelopment district, if it's the school district boundaries. So they have all of our mapping data that is current for Yuma County, and all of those things are being considered when they draft those initial maps. You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Those things are really very relevant, um, you know, uh, improvement districts, you know, things like that. So they'll have your input from staff in their report back to the commission. I can, I'll refer back to them. I'm not exactly sure how the level of detail they're going to be providing on the exact considerations for every map. I'm sure they're going to explain why each one is slightly different uh, depending on those considerations, but know that they are uh, analyzing all of that information, including our, our voter history information that I've provided them. All of those data points are considered when drawing maps. So you'll have that input. Great, thank you. So at our October 25th meeting, we'll have those initial maps to review and discuss with the mapping consultants. Moving to the November 22nd Redistricting Advisory Commission meeting, Remember, this will be one week after the public mapping period closes. So here at this meeting, we're hoping to discuss um, redistricting plan options, taking into account whatever feedback you had for the consultants from that first redistricting meeting, as well as public map sub submissions. In uh, the end of December, December 27th is our regularly scheduled redistricting commission meeting. Uh, discussion and action on which maps to present for the public hearings. This one is going to be important, and depending on how quickly this schedule is absolutely flexible. So if you adopt this draft schedule for now, no, it's not set in concrete. It can still be modified based on your pace. Um, so if you find that in November, you guys are coming to a pretty uh, close consensus, and you can already identify which map or maps for the community college district as well as the supervisorial districts to take to the public hearings, we may not need to meet in December. So keep that in mind as well. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Rickard. <clears throat> um, Tiffany, we, we did not see the uh, college district map. Um, can we have that at the next meeting? Yes, the existing, okay. the existing district yeah, map. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know that it's highly important, but we should be aware of what those boundaries are. Absolutely, we'll be sure to share that information. And um, thank you for noting that we did not have the breakdown of the new population for the existing community college districts as well. So we'll bring that to the October meeting. Yeah, it's all fine, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. So that is all in preparation of us going out and doing public hearings. And I wanna note here, the public outreach um, the commissioners do not need to attend. You are welcome to attend in your districts. We need to be mindful of quorum, though. So um, I believe Chair Zermano had an idea about um, attending those in-person, the in-district public hearings to ensure that we did not ever reach a quorum. Yes, and, and I wanted to uh, run this idea by 
um, the commissioners, if uh, you, each of you would volunteer or two of you would volunteer, uh, we could assign someone to attend scheduled meetings so that there is no accidental meeting, a quorum of, of commissioners. It would take quite a few of us. But. Yes. Um, but nonetheless, That's great. Yeah. if we could have volunteers to sign up hmm. to attend uh, scheduled uh, public hearings. Um, and how many of those, I'm sorry, <laughs> Madam Chair, if I may, how many of those will there be, Tiffany, in total? So we'll have the virtual public education, which again is a that is a public meeting. So we need to be mindful of the quorum on that item. That okay. will be beginning of October. The in district public hearings there'll be five, one in each supervisorial district. Personal, right? Exactly. Like at the library or exactly. Okay. And that will be held Physical. the Sorry, week a... between um, January tenth through the thirteenth. So on this, I wanted to note, we will have our consultants in Yuma for those four days. Since we have five districts, in the past, um, Supervisorial District 1 was handled at the Board of Supervisors meeting. But because of the shift to that district to the South County, we do want to make sure that the bulk of the population for District 1 had an in-person in the community. Great. So we're going to be, we'll need to double up on one of those days to where maybe most of them are in the evening, but we have one in during the lunch hour in the afternoon for that fifth district. Madam Chair, I think uh, okay. you can, since you're the chairperson, you can assign a person yes, I, I to, will. to show up at those. I, I think it'd be great, you know, uh -huh. that we have persons at each of those meetings uh, because people are gonna have questions and, um, I think that everybody on the right side of the dais can show up to all of those. <laughs> what I'll do is so I, Madam will, Chair, I, I will call everyone and uh, we can establish what dates uh, work and um, yeah, they have at least two, two per? people to attend each meeting. I think that's great. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Nichols? They're January 10th oh. to the 13th. I am going to be after you uh, yes. accept the, the draft schedule that I've presented here today I'm going to be working with each of the facilities that we've identified in the districts on their availability for dates and times and I will report back to you on the exact dates times and locations for those in district public hearings um, at the next redistricting advisory commission meeting thank you Ms. Anderson Madam Chair I'd like to uh, see the commitment from the uh, committee that at least two of us will show up at whichever one you assign. Thank you. Thank you. I have Tom to the 15th. 13th. 13th. Yeah. And it's in that it's in that kind of light green shade. I think it was a little bit difficult on the handout um, about midway down on the handout in front of you. So Concluding those in-district public hearings on the 13th of January gives us time to compile all of the feedback that we received from the districts to report out at our January 24th Redistricting Advisory Commission meeting. This will be the presentation and discussion of redistricting plan options and that information we gathered at public hearings for consideration for moving toward that final map selection. On February 7th, I anticipate we'll be at the Board of Supervisors meeting. At least I will be there. <laughs> the public hearing on the fi final map options and public hearing feedback. So what this means is we're going to present the draft maps where we've gotten to that point to the <clears throat> Board of Supervisors, open it up for yet another public hearing, and share the feedback that we received in the districts at the public hearings with the Board of Supervisors come back together on February 28th for potentially our last redistricting advisory commission meeting. It's for discussion and action, um, me bringing back those comments from the Board of Supervisors on how they felt about each of those map options that you presented. And um, hopefully at this meeting decide what the final map proposal for the community college district and the supervisorial districts will be to the Board of Supervisors for adoption on March 7th at their regularly scheduled board meeting. So at this time, I will take any questions or discussion on the draft. Thank you. Madam Chair. Nancy, I'm sorry. Uh, Nancy. Thank you, Madam Chairman. 
back to the early October virtual public hearing, <coughs> you, your comments made it sound as if you were planning one session at a lunchtime. Could I suggest that we offer more than one session on maybe two different days for people that couldn't do that one time? What I'm envisioning for this is because it's going to be virtual and we're going to record it, we're going to post it on the redistricting website for anyone to watch it for the duration of this process. Additionally, in the press release, we're going to give the public the ability to submit questions beforehand to be asked and answered at that um, public education event. I appreciate recordings being available, but then they're only hearing or seeing what in fact did occur. If we can offer more than one session, it might allow more people in the community to participate. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Madam Chair. Ms. Anderson, just a question here. Um, the virtual public education meeting uh, in, in early October, um, is that something that, um, who's going to hold that meeting or that education meeting? Uh, our consultants will be running that meeting okay. um, with my aid. So it'll be staff and consultant driven on that content. Mr. Blitz? I just want to kind of get a clarification on how this is all going to work. When you come out with these online mapping tools, and they're now available to each of us, so each of us then can draw our map and bring it to this meeting and present it? Or how's that going to work? Thank you for the clarification yeah, well, and the question. That's what I, uh, I want to know how this is going to work. Of course. So what happens with the public mapping tools is that they're done in that online environment and they're sent directly. Like when you submit them, they get, they're get provided to our consultant directly for consideration in tweaking the existing maps that are under consideration based on community feedback. So this is another way that you all, as private citizens, as well as the other community members, can identify those communities of interest, you know. Okay, so I'll use my online mapping tool and I'll draw the map the way I think it ought to be. And then that gets automatically submitted. I, I guess I hit a submit button and it gets submitted somewhere. And then somebody's going to analyze that as well as all these other maps and they'll come up with something. Mm -hmm. Okay, just want to get an idea of how this is all going to work. Thank you. Someone else have a question? Yeah, Madam Chair. I'd like to follow up on that. So um, thank you for your question. And, and so these maps all go to the consultant and they do what? So they take them under consideration. Is... So in discussions with our mapping consultants, they say some of them right off the bat aren't viable because they don't meet the thresholds, the legal thresholds sure. that we're bound by in the redistricting process. So some of them, you know, they'll know right right away this this isn't a viable option. Um, but there may be pieces of it that are viable. Again, back to that identifying communities of interest or the jurisdiction limits, which we already have through GIS data. Um, but it is helpful. This is just another way for the community to get involved in redistricting and feel like they have a voice in what those maps ultimately should look like. Oh, of course. Um, I'm, I guess I'm, maybe I'm not being clear. So they'll have, this gentleman's going to have 50 different maps, right? So do they take and kind of meld them all together and come back to us and say, like, here's two or three? that match sort of the majority of input? I'm sorry if I'm so, not making no, sense. It's, it, I appreciate the question and the opportunity for clarification. My understanding of it as well is that they look at the public submissions, and if they find that there's an idea that is a viable idea, it'll be brought back to this commission for consideration along with other maps that you are looking at and providing feedback on through the duration of the process. So from the records I saw from 2011's Redistricting Advisory Commission, they started out with an initial maps of, I think it was like A through D, something along those lines. 
And then based on the feedback from the commission as well as the public, the next meeting they came back with an A1 and an A2. You know, minor variations, like we like this map, but we think this piece should be changed. So it's going to evolve as we continue to meet and as, as we get more public feedback, as the commissioners have more feedback, as we hear from the Board of Supervisors. The maps are going to slightly change until we land on a consensus, a map that feels right for the community and for the county. Does that help? I think so, okay. yeah. Ms. Anderson? So, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, do you know whether there's feedback to the public when they submit a map? Is there some type of ticket, receipt, anything that says, thank you for your submission? That's a do great question. I will have our consultants at the next redistricting meeting explain the process a little more clearly on their end, what they see when the public submits a map to them. Thank you. Madam Chair. I mean, that was a great uh, point that you made. Would it go back to the public and say, like, somebody draws a map that takes in, it's being ridiculous, but San Luis, Arizona to Welton, and this is my district that I want. Would they get feedback that says, this just doesn't match, it doesn't work? Or I don't know that there's that level of back and forth. That level of mm -hmm. back and forth. No, I think it's submitted. It's considered um, in the context of the overall analytics of the different districts and census data that needs to be in consideration. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. Thank you. Blitz? So I won't know if my map is ever really considered or not, or any of our maps, any, anybody's submission. We really don't know how it was taken or how it was utilized. We won't have that kind of feedback. Probably not yours specifically. Like Mr. Blitz submitted, you know, map X yeah. that we want to consider. Likely not. I'm guessing it's going to be kind of a melding of all available information. Madam Chair, uh, just a quick question. Yes. Um, if there's time permits, maybe the consultant at that next meeting can show a quick five minute. This is how you log on. This is a map. This is an example. This is how you click. This leads you for feedback. You know, you can put a comment here and submit, and it's done. And maybe that, I don't know if that permits. Um, I, <coughs> but I, I just, uh, if it allows, if not. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, for the feedback. I want to point out that the intent for part of the October, the early October virtual education is exactly that. This is what this is where you can find it on the website. This is what it looks like. This is how you use it, and this is what happens when we receive your map submissions. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Any uh, further discussion regarding um, Ms. Anderson's presentation? So at this time, I um, want to call for a motion to approve the schedule um, or um, this schedule or alternate. So move, Madam Chair. A second? So oh, move. Oh, we got it. May I have a roll call, please? Aye. Um, the next on the item and I had a, uh, was item number six, um, discussion of public outreach events. So, Madam Chair, I will start off 
the um, this item by saying that this is a discussion of um, some ideas to help me plan for those in district public outreach meetings. Uh, so as we discussed at length in the last item, that early October meeting um, will be based on a date that our consultant is available, uh, and I will certainly communicate that information with this commission as soon as it is finalized so that you're able to share it um, with your uh, communities as well. The press releases and information um, will be shared with you as well. So for the in-district public hearings, as we mentioned, January 10th through the 13th, um, I am aware that there is a conflict with the City of San Luis's City Council, regularly scheduled City Council meetings on January 12th in the evening. So I'll be sure to avoid San Luis on that date to make sure there isn't conflict within uh, the community of attending two different public meetings. One date, as we already mentioned, one date we'll need to double up hearings. And my thought on this is that perhaps District 5 could be the meeting that we hold sometime during the day. Because it is a smaller, denser um, community, which means that they're more accessible to going to another district's meeting. Like these are not only allowable for individuals who live in that district. Anyone can go to any of these public hearings. We're just trying to make sure that we're in every area of the community for that accessibility for um, for input. I'm sure. Oh, she said that. Yes. Mr. Vice Chair, um, <laughs> Tiffany, how, how do we plan to put that word out uh, to encourage people to attend? Is there uh, radio, television, or you know, depend on Kevin? Uh, Mr. McLeod, thank you for the question. We will be doing regularly press releases. We're also planning on reaching out to each of the cities directly, as well as some of our major employers, school districts, things of that sort, to get the word out for these public hearings and the availability. Uh, I'm hoping that- Going through the school districts. That's great. Right, so we're looking at all of our major partners in the community to, um, to really spread the word about how to get involved in redistricting in Yuma County. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Um, again, on District 5, the consideration of maybe having this one during the day, they also have the ability to attend Board of Supervisors hearings because of the how tight that district is. It's really, I feel like, um, the one that has the most options to get to some of the other hearings. Uh, I'm open to thoughts on that as well. I don't want anyone to feel like they're being left out of this process. Uh, we want maximum participation from each of the districts. Um, after this meeting, I will work out logistics with po possible locations and dates for that January 10th to the 13th. So far, what we have in mind, so for District 1, um, potentially using Somerton Community Center or the Regional Center for Border Health's community room. Are there any other ideas for District 1 that I should consider in reaching out and trying to find a location? What about the fire department, perhaps? Is that what the building that you're speaking of? The fire department has a, a, mm -hmm. a big conference room as well. Do they? Okay, yes. that's great to know. Thank you. Yes? The, you mean the fire department in Somerton? Yes. Um, I think the yeah. community center is bigger than, the, oh, okay. than that um, okay. conference room. Good to know. Uh, for District 2, I'm in communications with Arizona Western College. They have really great rooms that are accessible to large parking lots. Um, it's easy to find. And another idea is using the Readiness Center, which is on the corner of Araby and 24th. Um, I believe that's where our Arizona National Guard is. It's one of their shared right. locations with the city. My only cop, Madam Chair. My only comment on that would be that uh, AWC is more recognizable. They're both locations are great, but when people hear uh, AWC, it'll be more recognizable. So, and I'm happy to report I reached out, and they re the president's office responded right away with great enthusiasm to help us host events, um, both for the redistricting as well as they, hopefully yeah. future um, vote centers for elections as well. Oh, good. Thank you. No charge. 
we're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Be mindful of that. <laughs> Thank nice you. point, Commissioner. I like that. That requires a couple of phone calls. <laughs> For District 3, we've identified St. John Newman Catholic Church. Um, Again, another large location out in the foothills, recognizable. It's, it's one that we use for our vote center out there, so a lot of community members know where it's located. Um, are there any other ideas for District Madam Chair. 3? Yes, Mr. McDonald. That's a great location. However, District 3 is massive. And so I would, sorry to uh, increase your workload, but I would think of a meeting in uh, Welton and also Martinez Lake. I mean, that's three meetings for one district, but that district is massive. Uh, thank, thank you for the feedback. I will look into that. I will say with Martinez Lake, the permanent residents out there um, is right around 100 individuals at any one time. So for them to make it to the foothills is probably similar to if Welton or East County needed to come into the foothills as well for a meeting. Mr. McLeod, I, I think at um, well, at one of the planning meetings for today, uh, we did talk about a potential meeting in Welton uh, would have made sense as well. Um, I'm not sure we'll have to look at those population uh, centers but it may be a good idea for us to I, I understand. Have a, yeah, I'll discount. A meeting in Welton. I'll discount uh, so, Martinez Lake. I understand okay. that. You're right. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Um, we will absolutely look out in Welton. In with that being said, I I'm somewhat unfamiliar with their locations out there. I, I know that we've used AWC Learning Center as a vote center location, as well as I think they have a church out there that's well attended. Are there any others that you're aware of? BFW out there. Yes. BFW. Okay. Yes, Ms. Tucker. Um, in addition to St. John Newman, there are other churches that are featuring the name. And it's going to be a dot on the foothill. The Methodist Church on North Greenwich. The Nazarene Church on North Greenwich. And there's also a community room at the uh, Foothills Library depending on um, attendance expectations. We were a little concerned about the size of the Foothills Library. Um, of course, with trying not to spend too much money um, with public events, we do look to public buildings first to try to, you know, work within reasonable budget. <clears throat> Thank you for those church options, though. I will absolutely, so I got Assembly of God, Nazarene, and I missed one, I think. Methodist Church. Mountain Methodist. Oh, right that's near Foothills Boulevard, right? It's North Frontage. North Road. Frontage. Yeah. And some former pastors of each of those have been very open for community meetings. And then when they have a change in personnel, they get used less often. So if you need introductions to the commission, For District 4, um, we've identified the Cesar Chavez Cultural Center. Is there another location in San Luis that may work well for, I'm hoping to plan for about 50 to 100 attendees at each of these events, not about knowing the library. The San Luis Library. I uh -huh. think it's a little too small. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think, I think the cultural yeah. center, it's, it's big enough it's big. parking. Um, they have enough chairs. Mm -hmm. um, as a sound system stage. Oh, great. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, Jeff, um, yes. San Luis High School might be available as well. They have a, a pack, <clears throat> which is pretty much sure. over 300 or 400 people. Great. Yeah, and San Luis High School is beautiful. I recently went there, and it's, it's amazing. Thank you. And for District 5, um, the Martin Luther King Jr. Youth Center or even this location here uh, where we're holding our meetings now uh, is within the district. Are there other locations that we should consider? Uh, city council chambers available at all? I can ask. Without a fee? Hopefully. <laughs> oh yeah. 
MLK is well known, though. I think I think that'd be a, a really good choice. Madam Chair, I think yes, that, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, I think ML, uh, MLK would be great to get that community involved. Right. If we want involvement with our, our, our citizens, and I think by us recognizing them as a viable spot for this meeting would be beneficial to everybody. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Hernandez. I, I also liked MLK because it's, it's one of the only things that we're doing in North Yuma. So if we have it at this location, yes, it's convenient, yes, it's well known, but it's, it's really in the city center. Um, so I think MLK will bring in those neighborhoods that are in North Yuma. Any other, um, what about times? Yes. So most of these I assume we'll want to do in the evenings for at least four of the districts. But what time do you think would be most accessible for the communities? 5.30, 6 p.m. Uh, would be ideal. I think that gives um, most people the opportunity to um, get out of work, or, you know, travel at wherever they need to travel. Um, that would be my uh, suggestion, that we do 5.30, 6 p.m. But 6 o'clock. Six o'clock. That gives yeah, everyone a chance to get off work and grab something to eat before they show up. I'm sorry, Mr. McClark. No, I, I think the chairwoman is right. So I will, um, as I mentioned, we, we could supply dinner. Oh, no. We would increase the. Uh, I know. <laughs> increase attendance. B Y O. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if you supply food. People are going to show Ms. Tucker, up. did you have a question? A, a comment or an observation. A lot of the Foothills residents do not attend the evening meetings, especially in the winter. So if one of these is going to be in the daytime, you might want to consider that one being a midday event. Yeah, good point. But, Madam Chairman, uh, uh, meetings I, that, that I conduct, uh, the problem that we have during the uh, during the winter time is we have a lot of senior citizens that cannot drive at night. Yeah, yeah, you won't get senior, you won't get Good seniors point. there. Uh, Could you a do note when I spoke to Supervisor Simmons asking um, some feedback from his district, I think his concern is in the winter. Uh, during the day, a lot of winter visitors are available to show up, but not working families, and so. Madam Chair. Mr. McClough. Um, could you consider just two meeting times? In in the foothills? Uh-huh. On the same day, same location, just, you know, 2 o'clock or in a 5.30 or whatever? Potentially. Does that make sense? It does. That, um, that's a great suggestion. I will, I'll work with, I'll see if our consultants are able to do that or if we can find a location that will allow us to have the space for an entire day. Yeah, is that does that work? I mean, I think it's a reasonable request to um, have two meetings in certain in certain areas. But I also think that if you're if we're going to have two meetings, for example, in the foothills, uh, there are other as, uh, districts that you know, have a lot of working families that may not come at noon. Um, no, I. For example, no evening is so evening best meetings. for I think most locations. Um, but in the foothills area, it's it's different. You know, it, it is, and I understand. I, I think to be flexible in that area, recognizing that it's a little bit different population, right? Um, to me, evening meetings for most people are accessible. I don't know too many people are going to show up for like a two o'clock or a noon meeting in, in, in San Luis or the middle of Yuma, right? But we don't know. Ms. Meister? Uh, my only comment is I do uh, I do have a club that meets and um, in the wintertime. It, it's Canadians, it's uh, Northwesterners. These aren't people that are concerned about voting for Correct. supervisors. So I don't see that as really an important issue. I'm sure. I, I think, uh, oh, well, just 
a comment is that we may be mildly surprised when when we look at the data of the voting population um, in the foothills and, and then look at it, the ages and we may even discover that um, most of the population um, like our winter visitors or winter residents maybe they're, we don't know if they're voting here so I mean or just the populations Mr. Pitts uh, Tiffany this doesn't preclude when you when you set these times up and you advertise it it doesn't preclude somebody that lives in district 5 to going to right. since they can't make it no. the times they can go to district 3s correct correct okay yes yes anyone can go to any of them yeah. we just want to make sure we have at least one right. in each of the districts Hernandez okay uh, madam chairman um, i'm getting confused uh, uh, we said two meetings that we uh, uh, are we talking about and we're talking about foothills uh, a meeting in the afternoon and a meeting at night the same day for the foothills is that what you were saying that was my suggestion okay. and madam chairman uh, I live out in the foothills uh, there are quite a bit of retired uh, Yuma residents uh, seniors out there quite quite a group right and uh, whether they show up or not that's a different story but I know that the the age out there, a lot of retired uh, voting voters out there. That was kind of the point, that, if I may, Madam Chair, yes. um, that you have foothills is an interesting area, right? Nothing happens after four o'clock <laughs> for some of the population, and there's others that they work and, and that's <clears throat> you know they can't make during the afternoon. That was kind of the um impetus for the suggestion that we have two in the one day any further com comments on the public sessions the public outreach events madam chair do we have any consensus on this or do we leave it up to ms anderson this is a no action item, so this was feedback for me from the commission to move forward with scheduling, finding locations and scheduling locations that are available on those dates to bring back the information at our next meeting um, to report out to you what dates and locations were ultimately secured for that week. I do want to bring back the discussion. Um, Ms. Tucker uh, comments her request earlier regarding the uh, virtual public education um, Miss Anderson if you would uh, be so kind as to look into that possibility of having two sessions uh, so that people could participate uh, live um, versus um, <coughs> looking at the video um, you know what would that entail for us or for you Yes, I will work with our consultants Thank on you. on that conversation and report back on the final schedule for the public meetings at our um, our next meeting on October twenty fifth. Thank you very much. Um, any other matters that need to be discussed? Um, I would like to call for a motion to. Or do I need to have a motion to close the call to the public, or can I just close the call to the public? I believe that's the chairwoman's prerogative. Uh, I will make a closing of the call to the public. You just announced it's closed, yes. Closed. Okay. And then this meeting is closed. <clears throat>